My guest today is Dr. Mara Beth Gentry. She is the current president of the National Convention of Gospel Choruses and Choirs. And so I am excited to talk to her and to share this information with the readers of Gospel Updates magazine. Dr. Gentry, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for allowing me this fabulous opportunity to speak with you and to be a part of your magazine article. Thank you so much. Bless you. As a world-acclaimed psalmist and what many people call the sanctified opera singer, can you share with us how your musical journey began and how it led you to gospel music? When I was a child, I was born into this gospel music arena because my because of my parents. They were so active. My father was uh, Dr. Thomas A. Dorsey's uh, vice president, and he worked with him, and they ran the roads together trying to build up the convention. And my mother uh, met him in 1938, and they got married. So that's the first part of the journey was my parents met at the convention, married, and then my brother and I came along later on. But that's where my journey started, and there's not a time that I can say in my life that I didn't love and be a part of gospel music, but my voice was never a gospel voice. It was um, operatic. So when I uh, graduated from college and uh, taught school um, education, that was my degree, was in education, and then I went back to school and got my master's in voice uh, pedagogy, and that's where I was, and that's where I uh, learned. I was already singing operatic, but that really enhanced my career, and that's where I thought I was going to go through the opera, and then I I went back and got some more uh, classes in that. But I always loved singing gospel music, but I just couldn't because I didn't have that type of voice, but it was always a part of my life. And as I began to sing at different venues all around the country and the world, they began to know me, but I never made it what you call big in the uh, field of opera because when I tried out for the Metropolitan Opera, I was too old. I was 32 then, and they told me that uh, they needed someone about four years younger, if I had been four years ago, they would have accepted me into the program, but I couldn't. So that's basically where I was. But Dr. Dorsey talked to me when they would hear me sing, and I he asked me one of the best things in my life. He asked me to sing Precious Lord for him, the song that he penned. And I think I, I just never understood when a, a composer asks you to do his number, you are so honored. And I was so nervous, but the Lord let me sing it. And that's when I became the singer, kind of the baby singer of the convention. I love it. I love it. Now, you've been a part of the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses for a significant amount of time and have witnessed its growth. How have you seen the organization evolve since your early involvement? And then what are some milestones that are particularly close to your heart? When I was, I was born in the convention. I've been a part of this convention for 75 years. And I have, my parent, like I said, I was born in this convention. And it is celebrating 90 years this year. And uh, I have seen it evolve with some of the finest artists that have ever come out, songwriters, great people. A year after year they come. And that is because our convention has kept updated with all of the things that we felt that were necessary to keep an organization going. And God is the one that has shown favor to us to keep us ahead and things that we've done. Only God can let an organization last 90 years, and it keeps growing, and it keeps growing. Persons have Many artists, songwriters said, if I started naming, you would say, oh, my God, when you think of the some of the greatest, uh, for one while, Aretha Franklin was in our convention. And then we had um, 
Diana Washington, and we had uh, Della Reese. Those were the early pioneers that were in here there, uh, and uh, it was just so many of them. And then now we have evolved, and uh, Bishop Hezekiah Walker was uh, part of our youth department, and so was uh, the one and only Donald Lawrence. And we can truly say it's many artists. Um, the songwriter of Every Day is a Day of Thanksgiving, Leonard Burke, he's still a part of us. And um, he's over the Thomas A. Dorsey Mass Choir. So every year God sends someone new to us that helps us. Um, in 2019, Mr. Don Jackson of the Stella Awards, uh, I went to see him back in 2014 to talk to him about our organization because he knew nothing about it. So they, people have come and gone into our convention that has helped, helped us to keep it relevant for such a time as this. And for the first time, we only we missed two years, and that was because of the COVID. I understand, yeah. Well, you know what? The, the National Convention of Gospel Chorus, Choirs and Choruses has a rich history dating back to the 1930s. How do you think the legacy of its founder, especially Dr. Thomas A. Dorsey, still influences the organization's vision and activities today? Dr. Dorsey was light years ahead of his time. That's how he was able to keep it relevant and keep it moving because he taught us how to think outside of the box. You know, everybody uses that term now. Well, he was doing that way before because he was the first person to have a printing company for music. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1938. He had that. And beyond the years of that, and he taught so many persons. And then he even had um, a home that he built in 1974, our convention building. He had the vision, and many of the persons worked with him, Sister Sally Martin, Mother Willamay Ford Smith, and uh, others. I'll get back with you on them. But they built this home from the ground up. It was his vision. So the gospel singers, no matter what part of the country they were from, could come. And if they ran on hard times or if they were no, you know, they were no, uh, had no family members or they were just alone or needed somewhere to be with other persons that appreciated music like they did, he built that. And, uh, it was a 10 story beautiful housing. Uh, complex, and uh, we lost it, of course, uh, years later because it was very, the upkeep was so expensive, but like I'm saying, he was light years. He was always thinking of gospel singers and how to promote them and their uh, musical talent. That is awesome. That is so awesome. Now, with the 90th session of the annual convention coming up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Can you give us a sneak preview or a sneak peek into what activities uh, we can expect this year and how does the convention aim to foster an appreciation for gospel music while still developing the spiritual growth of its membership? This year, the 90th year, we have had uh, artists that are going to come and support us just because of the 90th year and Dr. Dorsey and what he did. And also, I cannot go any further without talking about the leadership of Bishop Kenneth H. Mose Sr., who was my predecessor. It's only been three presidents in the whole history, the 90-year history of the convention, Dr. Dorsey, then Bishop Mose, and now myself, which I'm the first female. And uh, I'm telling you, this year, the floodgates have opened. People are being so kind to us, such as yourself, to advertise, to talk about it. Sunday night, we are going to uh, – Bishop Hezekiah Walker is doing the choir fest. Wow. This will be the second year he's doing, the, he's doing the choir fest for us to support us and to bring in a gala event 
opening of the um, national convention. Also, that Sunday morning, the uh, everybody that's there in the parish, they will be honored with a sermon. Our opening uh, service will be with the one and only Bishop Paul Morton. Wow. And um, and uh, Bishop, I mean, everybody. And then during the week, the, uh, Donnie McClurkin will be there. Uh, to uh, help us. He told us he was coming and he was going to support us. And we have, during the week, there will be Brother Donald Lawrence. That Monday night, we will be honoring, we will be recognizing the city of New Orleans with the, um, with honoring uh, their choir. We have a new chapter there by President Shambliss and they are singing. I mean, that's a singing entity. They're new this year. And they're going to be featured on Monday night, and then we have other artists that are coming in for Monday night. Uh, and we have many guests that are going to be there that week. Uh, Mr. Don Jackson from the Stella Awards will be there probably Tuesday, and then Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. It just keeps going on and on. We even have a um, a CD uh, of, of Brother. Uh, Minister Jeff, uh, uh, Jesse Williams and Total Praise Horror, they wanted to, uh, have their CD release at our convention this year. Oh. So they're going to do that. So, and, uh, we were supposed to have had this year as two of our guests that God took home before we, before they could come. And that was the one and only, uh, brother, uh, Lemons from Atlanta and, uh, Keith Wonderboy Johnson. We're going to be with us this year. They had already committed, and I am so sorry to say that they won't be there because the Lord took them home. But we have other artists that are coming that are going to be such an integral part to keep us going. That's good. That's good. Now, as a former educator, how do you think education and music, especially gospel music, complement each other in shaping the character and spiritual growth of individuals? When I was, uh, I taught music for two years and um, because I had got my degree in music and I taught it for two years, I always incorporated it into my subject matter. And a lot of the children know gospel music, so they don't mind because I would have talent shows and what have you. And believe it or not, every show that I ever put on with the kids, somebody was going to do a gospel number. Mm -hmm. So it was such a wonderful thing. And um, like I said, the kids know the gospel music. Even, I don't care what uh, race or denomination they were. They knew some type of gospel song. And um, like, Oh, Happy Day, being a part of it. And, and for a while before he passed away, he was on, he's on, he was on our board too, uh, the one and only uh, Edwin Hawkins. And we still have the tremendously talented and a pioneer of gospel music, and that is the one and only Dr. Bobby Jones is still a part of us. He's still on our board. He comes every year, Edwin did, and many of the others that have come to support us. So gospel music and education, they cross each other. Because when we were in New Orleans the last time, we had a class that we had from the, uh, the Mahalia Jackson School there, and we brought the kids to have a summer camp with us. And they came every day and uh, did that. And that Monday, we had honored the memory of Mahalia Jackson since she was from New Orleans. So there's always educational opportunities. And this year, we're going to be dealing with seniors, too, mm -hmm. and the crossover. We have to keep our seniors and the youth occupied. We go from – we have we have organizations, we have kids – all the way from we have classes and music training for children all the way from the little babies from like four all the way up and our oldest member is a hundred and something now so we have all that ram in between that has just god has just blessed us to keep it relevant to all ages got it stop my alarm my sister went off um Two questions, two more questions. You've partnered with the Salvation Army for over 40 years through When Singers Meet, Incorporated. 
Can you tell us about this partnership and how it aligns with the mission and values of the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses? We always wanted to make sure. My parents started me going that I was a sophomore in college when I started in 1968 with my parents. They were the leaders of that, and we kept it up to from 1968 to 2011. We did every second Tuesday of the month at the Salvation Army. We never stopped all those years. And then they got new leadership, so they went a different way. Uh, but because of the gospel music, they all, the men were always inspired. They were homeless. Uh, the, the, the most of the persons that we dealt with were the male section of the Salvation Army. Mm -hmm. And they would come and they would sit. We would sing to them. We would talk to them. You have to communicate. Music is a universal language, mm -hmm. number one. And I don't care what frame of life you're in, everybody can be inspired by a good gospel song. It's so much going on now, and that's why I'm so proud. Gospel music is still strong. Uh, in 2009, uh, when uh, uh, President Obama was there, he um, had a law that was from a doctor of uh, mm -mm, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee uh, from um, Houston. They set it up so that September would be gospel music history month and that has still been going on and they really celebrated in the city of houston and other places but she also had a uh what do you call it a um a, a meeting every year of grand gala musical at the uh, uh lincoln center there in, in Washington, D.C., because I went for about five years, and pandemic cut it out for two of the years, so I don't know if she's going to start it back up. But in September is Gospel Music History Month, so put it in there so people won't forget that. Celebrate it the whole month of September because it's put aside in Congress that that is the time that we will celebrate gospel music. I love it. Well, listen, um, as an individual who's dedicated your life to gospel music and spiritual enrichment, what advice do you offer to someone who aspires to follow a similar path and make a difference through gospel music? My advice to them is to stay true to what you believe in. And if gospel music is a part of your life, you will never be sorry that you followed the King's Highway going through that music because it keeps you uplifted and inspired. Mm -hmm. Now, the number one's going to tell you the road is going to be easy, but it is going to be where you can handle life situations because mm -hmm. gospel music does. You can look on the uh, YouTube or anywhere else you want to look, and you'll always find a gospel song that will inspire you to continue your life journey no matter what comes up. And that's where gospel music comes in. It When you get that, stay with it. Not only you – that that doesn't say you have to. That's the only thing you can sing. But mm -hmm. it's such a great part of my life. So when I want to inspire or be inspired, I always get a gospel song that – something that can reach my very soul and mm. snap me out of whatever situation I'm going through, and it will help you go through it because that's a life journey, and nobody told you that it was going to be easy. I don't know people tell people, well, you get a Christian, you become saved, everything is going to be all right. I don't know where they read that. But it's not, in the, it's not in the Bible I've been reading. But because you're not going to. But the thing is that the strength is there in the mm -hmm. music and in the word from God. You get those mm -hmm. two things together and your life will be bearable and you mm -hmm. can move along and keep moving along. That's good. That's good. 
Well, Dr. Gentry, listen, thank you so very much for taking time to share your insights and experiences with the readers of Gospel Updates magazine. Now, if someone wanted to connect with the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Choruses today, where would you say they need to go to connect with you today? Okay. We have a website, ncgcc.org or ncgcc, comma, inc.org. One of those will take them to our page, and they can find out all the information about the upcoming convention and many things. And, oh, I have to add this, and one of the greatest things in my life was when I was younger, and Mahalia Jackson came to St. Louis. A a lot of people don't realize how into the civil rights movement that she was. And James Meredith had just gotten shot at trying to enter into Ole Miss, and she came to St. Louis to help raise money for him, his hospital bills, and his continued education. And I was a part of the choir that background her. It was about nine singers. It wasn't a big choir, it was of course. And she saw my hair, and she said, I, I want to fix your hair to go out on the stage. And Mahalia Jackson combed my hair. And fix wow. my hair, and I went out on the stage. I have to tell her, that. I mean, she was just awesome, and wow. she was a great part of our convention because Doctor Dorsey wrote many songs for her and for her to perform. So that was it. Now back to the convention. I had to drop that in there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you so much for that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, but that is, uh, and you can check with. Uh, it's ncgcc, mm-hmm. comma, inc. dot org or ncgcc. dot org. I love it. Again, Dr. Gentry, thank you so very much for being a guest today and sharing your insights and wisdom with the readers of Gospel Updates. Well, thank you. And I have to tell you this: we have one of the finest. Board of Directors and the people at the convention, we call ourselves a family, and we do. We act like that. If you ever come, I hope you could come so you can understand the warmth that the National Convention of Gospel Choirs and Courses has. It's a family convention, and we come and we sing and we shout, and we have a wonderful time. So I hope those of you can meet us in New Orleans starting July the 29th through August the 4th at the Sheraton. I love it. Well, I I plan to be there. And, um, again, thank you so very much for being the guest today. Well, no, thank you for your time, and thank you for allowing us to share with you. And we look forward to it. And just let us know anytime. Feel free to call, and I'll be glad to do anything that I can. All right. 